Good morning, everybody. So yeah, my background, I've been trained as an architect and always interested in new technologies. And um, I guess I ma my master was in 2005 in the US, Georgia Tech. We had the first design to fabrication uh, master where the goal was to build a piece of a building scale one. And we faced a lot of non-standard components and I understood right away what, what was the the, the impact of, of non-standard design towards all the way throughout the, the, the entire production uh, production change. Hence, the need of a very strong streamlined digital chain. So coming back to my presentation today, you might find my title a bit redundant. And I guess I chose that title as an architect has been always more interested into design while Working at Felix, it's been the first time I'm actually on that side of the of the of the industry, and I see how, of course, design matters a lot. But what matters even more is the way you manage your data, and especially the way you manage all your suppliers and all your supply chains. So if you don't do that properly, you are basically dead. So I guess integrating 3D Training people in 3D here was not the big part of the job, but the, the hidden part of the iceberg is managing all of this data. So I guess that's what I'm going to try to explain to you today. Um, coming back to Felix, uh, a brief um, history session. We we were uh, in the 35, 1935. It was a serrerie. We were just doing a, a bit of, uh, of, of railing and, and, and door knocks and, and all of that. And eventually started doing a bit of more training, started being a, a factory, started innovating in 65 on, on, on curtain wall, trying to break the, the thermal bridges and, and the first, yeah, I guess a bit more, more, more interesting projects, the UN um, building in Geneva in 71. Then we started working a lot for all these Swiss companies like Nestle, and we did this uh, Barcelona one in 73. It's like, uh, we've been abroad in Syria and Iraq, and finally opened our uh, subsidiary in London in 1919, and um, continued so far um, having two offices, one in Switzerland and one in um, in uh, uh, UK in London, and of course, yeah, 2014 we started um, working with BIM and working with Lean, lean Management. Um, this is our production facility in Switzerland. So I am actually sitting in the little square cubic office where it's within 1.5 thousand square meters, which means we're directly linked to the factory, which makes very interesting to work there because we're just the middle-sized company that enables us to directly go and see what, um, how we produce what we actually design. A little bit of a sneak peek inside where you see a production chain that we, we have, um, we do 60,000 square meters per year, so it means uh, a certain amount, but it's not that big. We're not like Permas to Lisa or, or some others like Uwanda who are like really, really big and that have a lot of continuous automated production chains. We have a bit of a semi-automated production chains, like the standard you can see on the top left. But then we have also how we can sell is actually doing really, really custom work, like the, the, this angle element for the new UN project we're working on in Geneva on the bottom left. And on the right, you can see these facade elements that are ready to be sent on site. We also, um, I mean, I was talking before about semi-standard facade productions elements. It's all flat and, 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 and square and, and 90 degrees. But we also try to get into, I guess, the three form or um, curve markets, which we don't have much knowledge so far. I do. I was working for Gay Technologies and Zaha did before. So we're pushing for these markets. Um, so, yeah, uh, what we do is um, semi standard production elements. This is the BIM model of the UN project we're working on now. 
this is kind of how I try to implement the 3D modeling of it and having every single component and how to manage all of these data. And this is another project that we've been pinching in, pinging in, in London in uh, Picasso Circus, which is a way more non-standard project with a funky roof. So we also try to address that um, co kind of complexity. This is our um, money maker, what we sell to a client. We sell these profiles that we don't buy on, on catalogs like Shuko or, or, or other ones. We design and produce our own I mean, we subcontract the production of our own profiles. So every single project, project has, a, has a Bible like that, and they're all different. So this is really how we get clients, how we have architects also who like to work with us because they know that we will do exactly, we will fit their uh, thermal, their aesthetical, and their um, um, also uh, thermal requirements. Uh, customization means uh, a little bit of a setup in the production chain or in the digital chain, right? So if you try to go through the different steps, and this graph tries to simplify it quite a lot, but what it tells, it tells you that if you do different objects within a production chain, it means an iterative, iterative workflow. Uh, because every time you change, you slightly change an object, the next guy on the line might not know, might not have anticipated the changes, so he needs to get back to you in order to know what are the exact changes. Even though if you do the proper design, things might still not be completely understood. And this is also what we try to address uh, when you look at these old pictures, again, this um, systematic way of reducing cost through automation of a production of the same element thousands and thousands and millions of times. So it's all very well engineered in beforehand in a way that every single worker don't even have to use its brain. It knows what to do. It just does all the gesture automatically. Um, while 50 years later, um, the theories with Toyotism try to break through this after the problem of overproduction when they realize that doing all the same object too many times, you might run into overproduction and clients might need or might want some different objects. So that's how factories and the industry started to be more adaptive and, and to be able to change the, 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 the objects they're actually proposing on the market. So, also, workers started to be more flexible and responsible because they don't do only one task, but 10 or 15 or even 20 tasks, like a piece of a car. So this is a little bit what I'm trying to do here also. Uh, the entire construction industry is always a bit late compared to the other ones. Um, and we have this silo effect outside our company, right? Architects, engineers, and, and construction Companies are broken down, fragmented by uh, by a legal uh, framework and matters. And within Felix, the same. Every single department works a bit separate, separately and 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 protect themselves. Whenever that, whenever there's an error, they try to just say, okay, this was not us. This was the other one, et cetera, et cetera. So what we are trying to do is is defragment all of this, make people have more trust into the overall work. And, and um, so, yeah, trying to go through the theory of concurrent engineering, I'm not sure if you're aware of that concept, but it's a bit opposed to sequential engineering where everything is broken down by tasks and by departments. We're trying to just say, okay, somebody on the production line doesn't need to have the other guy finished, entirely finished with his work to start working on it, you can already have a look at the drawings or other 3D, even though if a designer hasn't finished everything. Sometimes he has only 5% to change. So you can already have a broad idea of what you're going to have to do next. Um, and the ultimate tool for um, concurrent engineering is obviously a commodity environment, which is what we 
what I've been trying to set up in um, in Phoenix, which is a big deal to bring the people from one project, one team within this environment, but it's also a much bigger deal to bring people from other departments and also clients and subcontractors. So that's, I guess that's where, when you get that, that's when it really pays off. Um, one of the main things, uh, why did we try to work on a command data environment? I mean, searching for them, it seems that a lot of these are design driven. They're all mainly in the AEC. Um, they are another layer put on top of some designed um, uh, tools, while I think the bigger thing a facade manufacturing company needs something to manage uh, the supply chain, like a ERP, right? So that's why what we try to do is to get all of these data from the ERP or from what we are doing and linking to eventually a 3D model. And that's why we created our own. For this, we are lucky to be in Switzerland and they're very smart people because they have all these wonderful universities with PhD from all over the world coming over and they are trying to make profit for the PMEs, the, the, the companies within Switzerland to take advantage of, let's say, the knowledge that might still be in universities, but to not yet in the companies. So this Inno Swiss is a little bit of a, a framework uh, held by the state to enable collaboration and enable Felix actually, uh, to be a bit more blunt, to have a free PhD to develop a platform, a custom common data environment just for us. So this was what I call the constellation. It's a little bit of the workflow that I tried to, to sketch once I came here. And um, as you can see, there are a lot of little nodes with different lines, sometimes continuous, sometimes discontinuous. So we've been working, trying to just make them continuous from one to another, but it's not, not very easy to, to understand what is what, but you can see that 3D, there's 2D, and it's da, da, da. So we also try to map throughout the different departments that you can see in vertical, uh, and try to use the different projects that we are actually using the platform and all the tools we are trying to automate. So the projects are every time a little bit of an excuse to improve and to have more automation from the precedent one, okay? So we are very much into this process, identifying what was went well in one project and what has to be better in the next project. And also trying to identify the different tools that we are having before they were only talking working on AutoCAD and SolidWorks. So we still have AutoCAD for validation drawings. But uh, yeah, we're trying to integrate common in the, the entire environments like CD Experience, but also Platform X, which is our own CDE that we develop with um, Zurich, the ATH. And trying to identify what does which tool, okay, I'm sure. If you work for companies, you all have different kind of projects, different sizes, different level of complexity. So it's always a bit difficult to say we have only one workflow. It also depends on resources. Sometimes you have the good people, sometimes you have not as talented people to work on your projects. So it's not that you can always have the top notch of the tools and the people working on the project. So you have to be a bit adaptive. And this is a bit the roadmap that we are uh, been following for the development on this platform. So all the way from bids, then trying to get tools for better approval, then um, helping with the design and mostly trying to do automated naming of all these thousands and thousands of components we're managing, trying to link our CD with the ERP, which is Sage in our sense. In our sense. And then ensure that we have an as model in this 3D environment that enables whoever in five or 10 years from now to find all documents that they need to uh, replace a door if needed. And basically, yeah, what we are trying to do in the BIM group is that we are not responsible of the data itself, but we're trying to, we are responsible of the link and the packaging of the data. And each person within each department is responsible of the data, okay? 
Um, yeah, I might, might be running a bit late, but he, I will go a bit deeper between two different projects in which we developed a lot of uh, a lot of um, of these little routines to um, have our digital chain to be smoother. So first of all, the U1 project that started two years ago, we, I tried to integrate all Project Fireball in a semi-automated environment, which means this is what you get from an architect. You have elevations with pre-identified types, um, S1, standard one, standard two, et cetera, et cetera, with different dimensions. Do you have shutters or not? What kind of glass color do you have? And then you try to in integrate this into an elevation matrix with U and Vs to identify where your panel is in the project. And each of these panels is just an abstract representation, rectangle of each panel with the zero design in it, but all the metadata on the left that enables to actually qualify that panel and differentiate it from the next one. So the first work is this, trying to have this placeholder to have all the information you need to actually fabricate it. So this is a bit what we start having and, and try to have in the early times of the project to enable us to plan our costs and to do bidding for our subcontractors to pre-command the glass, the, the mullions, et cetera, et cetera. And then what we want is once everything has been approved by the architect, you want to have all the projection, well, the digital change smoothly completed and then go all the way to fabrication as smooth as uh, you want. So that's a bit what we did. It's been still very manual on the UN, but we're trying to integrate now for the next project to have all of this pretty much automated between the database here that you have on the platform X and then the catalog of all components with 500 LOD details that we have on 3D experience. So what we're trying to do for the next project is connect our platform to uh, 3D experience and Katia. The way we're doing this is to have a data structure that's very clear, okay? Um, this is the life cycle of one profile. It changes name when it's designed, when it's ordered, when it's delivered, then when it's treated, it's painted or not, and then it's smelled, and then finally assembled every time this pool profile is changing name. So that's also what we're trying to do. We try to just uh, use life cycle functions and try to, if we have more than 2,000 different components, if each of them has six different names, then of course you can see that the database has quite a hard task to uh, maintain them, especially if you have to do that by hand. So we started implementing dictionaries and um, typological uh, naming conventions to say which is the subcomponent your mullion is uh, from. Is it the ecran? Is it the skeleton? Is it the opening part of the of a window? Then what do you have? Do you have a, a mullion? Do you have a transom? Do you have a, um, a piece of glass? Do you have a join? Then where is it? In the window? Is it on the left, to the right, up and down, and the middle? And then you have the increments of the different um, the different instances. And then using, obviously, the tree structure of Katia to ensure that you already have the pre-assembly method which is reproducing exactly what you have on the production chain. And then each of them have these little labels and then proper names for the guys to assemble them without asking them too many questions. So you have this big matrix that was still extracted or done semi-manually with more than 160 types on 1,600 panels to be delivered. But, so that means 10% of different families. This more than 2,000 pieces. So each of these types had to be extracted to the right in this um, catalog that enables to know which components are in which, um, which window elements. And this is where we then try to do our uh, platform to go before all of this and to try to do the, the administration of all of that project. So we have this interface where we have different functions. We create a new project, then we visualize 
the project where we can extract quantities, we can color code and, and see a lot of, of the data that's in. Then we have an Excel-like interface that we just actually um, have been developing. And uh, the basic data model that will help us to automate to, for the automated naming of our products. So I, it's been already 20, 25 minutes. I don't know how much more time. We say it's half an hour. Maybe here I can now jump into the platform and show it to you. I will load now the project we are working on, the Sherwood in London, on Piccadilly Circus. So this is where I create my project. I won't do it now. I will visualize it. So these models have been done in Katia, and we have some scripts in Katia to be able to generate automatically for each panel all of these metadata, the length, the height, the, the area, and also know where it is in the building. That's not much, but then we have these other sets of parameters that get back on the PM parameters, but we can add customized parameters, which means if you need a certain a specific class, if one has a blinder and another panel don't have a blinder, you can always compile this. Basically, you have all the specifications given by the architect that you can fill that in there. So then you have these color filters where you can see, okay, I want to see here, uh, this one is at these dimensions, and you want to do a little bit of parsing. So how many of these are that length? So we have this color filtering where the database gives you instantaneously all the different values. You can see that they have 135 different widths of panels. So that's a lot of different in the building. And you can see all the values and the quantities of each. And then you can see also the percentage from the entire area of all you have to deliver and the, area, the sum of the area. So the idea here is along the development of a project to facilitate access to information, okay? Always project managers, always people working on design, they're like, oh, but how many panels like that we have? Or what's the area of, of elements with blinders we have? So this is all information that you need to have as quick as possible. You don't want to go through all the PDFs and all the specs from the architect. You need to have this compiled and up-to-date in a synchronous, always available environment like that. So we did, for all of these options, we have the same filters. So for example, arch type, these are the types given by the architect. We have 10 different types. And same thing, I can say, oh, okay, now I want to see, oh, which is the WT4? Oh, they're here. So these are these panels. So what's up with these panels? I get back on it. Now I see that these panels, there are just, yeah, 12 of them, and they're like 2% of the entire area. So that's not too much of a deal. They're not a big percentage. But I can see that the WT3, for example, there's like 20% of the entire surface. Then if I continue all this data, I uh, need to access it a bit more directly also to have more numberings. For example, I want to see on the east facade what are the um, um, areas. And then we set up this tool called the 3D tags. Or you can see right away the area from one to the other. Or if I want to change, I just want to see the arch type. I want to see what type do I have here. So basically, any parameters you have here, you can see it. And so I don't know if you're contractors, you know how many times you have to do these little elevations. And we actually did these tools to be able to, OK, if I need to draw an elevation, I'm not going to draw it by hand. I'll just extract it directly from this platform. OK. Um, OK, then I have on other projects some other tools, project management tools on the UN project. Once you have been um, getting all of your objects on site, you want to see um, what are the instances, okay? Uh, so you want to see the status of it. So these are the instances, which means 
if I first show you all the elements that are the same, then you have the types. So we have 144 types on the U1 project. So it's telling you all, okay, all of these are the same, all of these are the same, all of these are the same. Okay, so I have all the information I need always here on the left. But then all of these are different, obviously, they're trapezoids. They all have different dimensions. But then you want to keep track of what's been put on site and what is not. So you have instance name. So basically you see, and you can show that to the client, you can follow every day what's been put on site. So you can see that all of these, the kind of standard ones are put there, but all of these are not. The angles are not ready. And you can see, of course, it's like a staircase here. All of these are not put on site neither. What you can do, for our friends from uh, as built models, you can click on an element and then we have this sheet called the quality control. It's a closed cavity project where we have huge, very drastic regulations. So we have 10 pages of verifications controlling the joints, controlling the pressure, the air tightness of the elements. So we're having this as built model within this uh, environment. Okay. So I guess this is a bit of a 3D interactive part that you have all the metadata or the database running the, the backside. But what we wanted to do is also access that database directly through this interface where what we did here is basically a live Excel where we can drag and drop all of these columns and all of these metadata, facade on which facade you are, you can parse it by facade. You can parse it by type here. Which component do I have? And then I don't know if you guys know the pivot tables, but basically I can drag and drop these and start having a better lecture of how many types do I have, okay? And how many types per facade do I have? So it can be quite convenient sometimes to do quick surveys and have an idea of what do I have where. And basically, if I want to extract this, I'm saying, okay, this is what I want. I want to extract all the information concerning the elements that are on W4 and all the standard ones that are the 8,000. So then I can just export to Excel and have a look at that Excel sheet, which I have here. So the idea is, again, instead of having everybody having its own Excel sheet, AutoCAD plan, is that everybody sustains the platform, but then once this is on the platform, you can always extract it and do whatever you want on it with your local copy. Sometimes it's also a bit difficult to know, oh, where am I actually? So we still wanted to have the link with uh, the viewer, and this is what we have here. Okay. So you can run all the stats you need. You can do pivot modes, you can do filters and filter down through zones and all kind of filtering you're doing on Excel and having this there and then basically use the, the, the viewer to parse through all of this. Okay. And it's the same thing uh, with the ERP data. This is what we have in our ERP. And this is how the, all the data per component and per lot has been entered in our ERP. So you can cross-check and cross-reference the information, the design information and the production information here. Okay. And uh, so I guess that's pretty much it. The last thing I wanted to show is the last mode, which is the supplier. So if I write the name of the project, and then do another password. So here I jump directly into this screen, and this is what we gave, for example, for this bid. The guys were in Brooklyn, we are in Switzerland, so it's all easy to communicate, so we just wanted them to access our model and go through a bit of the data parsing uh, that we've been doing, and have them seeing that you're trying to, to um, of course, I, I guess it's a bit, uh, a bit of a nice thing to show. We're not 
doing rabbit bin, but we're trying to invent or create our own tools to facilitate um, communication and, and transport of information even across continents. Okay, so I can click here. I see the data of this one. And yeah, same thing. All these color filters, they're automated tools that are adapted to any any project, any parameter that's in the that is uh, representing to the database. Okay, so I guess I'm um, pretty much finished here. I didn't show a lot of Kikia, but yeah, we still continue to develop this platform now. And all of this data here, we have um, scripts that recognizes through the comparison of all these parameters and recognizes how many different components do we have. And now we're linking this to the database parameters and to the Katia catalog. And then hopefully we get an automation in Katia that will almost automatically generate 3D plans, drawing like anything needed um, for the production of all, all of these uh, elements. If they're all the same or they're all different, uh, that's what we're trying to do. A workflow that can manage different le level of of, of um, customization or going towards more standardness. All right, I think I'm finished here and uh, I'm ready for some questions. I think we've, all the uh, questions have come forward. If there's any more, can, if I can address the participants, if there's anything more you'd like to know, just um, come back to us uh, via email and we'll get Paul to answer that. So uh, thanks for that for very much, very much Paul. Um, Thanks participants for joining us for this, um, this presentation. We've got some more coming up uh, every week uh, for the next few weeks, so we'll keep you posted on what's coming, what's coming on. Thanks very much then.